Hi guys, welcome or welcome back. Thank you so much for being here. It's so greatly appreciated, it truly, truly is. Before we get started, let me give you my usual disclaimer. This video is for educational purposes only. Please do not take what I say as fact. Please always do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Next, if you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. So, today we're talking about Lamb Core One. And we've covered a lot of crazy stories on this channel, but this is one that definitely takes the cake. So, all I could say is buckle up because it's about to get nuts. I actually, and I guess I'll do it on this one too. Why the hell not, right? I just filmed the video of Abby Choi, who was the, um, I can't even think, now I got brain blockage. <laughs> Abby Choi, who was the 28-year-old socialite that was from Hong Kong, which is where this story is also. And she, her ex-in-law's, chopped her up and made soup out of her it's awful it's all over the internet also but if you want to go see that one point being why i'm bringing this up why am i bringing this up okay the reason i'm bringing this up is because right before i sat down to film this and abby's i opened this look how cute okay and it has my name on it this is and it says, when life gives you lemons, make pink lemonade. Don't be a sour bitch. It's so cute, right? Look at the top. I'm very excited about this. So the owner of this, she does not know that I have a channel. She does not even know that I am shouting her out. It's the Copper Peony Company. Okay. So the reason I'm actually doing this is because, well, first of all, she did an adorable, she did such a good job really cute job so if you guys wanted to go check out her company it's just she's just a small business owner trying to make it like the rest of us so I wanted to help her out I loved it I actually just came randomly came across this I think on Facebook or on Etsy and I just I don't know I had to have it and right before I came to sit down I opened it and I was like oh my god how can I not show you guys in case anybody's interested in going to check her out okay so let's get into lam korwan he was born on may 22nd 1955 in british hong kong his father worked for a petroleum company in brunei from 1957 to 1962 and he would visit the family in hong kong when he was on leave from the job his father would move the family to Brunei to live with him and his pregnant mistress. This included Lamb's mother being forced to live with the mistress that was carrying her husband's baby. Okay. And you know what? No no shade to the mom because I don't know maybe the mom was just in a position where she had nowhere else to go and she had kids and she I want to shade the father and I want to shade the mistress I don't even want to shade the mom because I don't know what her situation was but dad you suck and pregnant mistress if you knew you suck too that's it in December of 1962, the family moved back to Hong Kong. Then in 1970, his father decided to open up a motorcycle store where Lam would often work. It's been alleged that Lam's father was quite abusive to him and working at the shop with his father only made their relationship more strained. His mother would say that Lam's father would routinely him um, when he was as young as two years old, claiming that he would hit his head up against walls and even gave him two black eyes on one occasion. After moving back to Hong Kong, the family lived in a very small apartment 
and Lamb would share a room with his brother. Growing up, Lamb was described as a loner with his one passion being photography. Not realizing this passion would end up being the downfall of his twisted actions. Okay. So, Lamb lacked social skills. And because of this, it was very difficult for him to form relationships with his peers and his teachers. After graduating from school, Lamb continued to work at his father's motorcycle shop before deciding to work for another relative's air conditioning company as an air conditioning apprentice until eventually deciding that he wanted to drive a taxi. Okay, whatever. I mean, sometimes it takes us, you know, you got to try a few things out before you find something that sticks. That's fine. That's cool. Lamb never had a girlfriend, and he purchased a massive stash of PORN magazines from online from Britain because he was too embarrassed to buy them in person at the store. Okay, again, whatever. His family had no idea that any of this was taking place, even though they all lived in a very tiny apartment. But the reason for this is... Because they kept, the reason for this was because he kept the stash in a lockbox. In 1973, at the age of 18, Lamb decided to purchase a Polaroid camera for himself. He would sneak into public bathrooms. I mean, first of all, do you know how big a Polaroid camera is? He would sneak into public bathrooms and he would take the camera and put the camera underneath the stalls and take pictures. And women would obviously get pissed off and they would chase him, and but he ended up getting away. Eventually, when he was about 19 years old, the family began to notice an unhealthy obsession with the female body. They would later catch him peeping at his sister's naked body while she got changed. No, God, please, no, no, no. Uh, pump the brakes there, buddy. That is, oh, you, you, you're going way too far. Ugh. In 1978, Lamb obtained his taxi driver license, and in 1980, he became a taxi driver in the evening. Shortly after taking the job, Lamb's mother noticed more strange behavior from her son, saying that he began to seem depressed, he refused to change clothes, and he refused to shower. He was eventually admitted into Castle Peak Hospital to seek treatment for his mental illness, before being released 102 days later. Wednesday, February 3rd, 1982. Lamb was working when he came across a 21-year-old dance hostess named Chan Fung Lan at about 4 a.m. After Chan had finished her shift that night, she decided to go out for drinks with her sister and her girlfriends. Tired and very intoxicated, she decided to head home. So quite a few taxi drivers had rejected her because she was so clearly intoxicated. And this seems to be a typical practice for drivers in Hong Kong because I'm guessing because of the liability of picking up such an intoxicated passenger. I can't blame them. But Lam was more than willing to pick her up. And... He even pulled over for her during the ride so that she could vomit outside of the car. So the way the story goes is that after she puked, she asked Lamb to take her back to her sister and her friends instead of taking her home. So Lamb agrees. On the way back to her sister, she changes her mind and she asks Lamb to bring her back to her original destination, which was her home. It was at this point that Lamb snaps, pulls over the car, and the woman with an electrical wire. 
At around 5 a.m., he drives back to the apartment that he shares with his family. He drives past a sleeping security guard. He drags the body upstairs and he hides it underneath a sofa and he goes to bed. The following morning, after his family leaves for work, Lamb steals the money out of her purse and he goes to buy an electric saw. Do you see where this is going? With her own fucking money. You scumbag. With her own money, huh? You can't even afford to buy it yourself. <laughs> buy that shit yourself. At, at the very least. I'm just saying. After he returned back home, he laid her body on the floor on top of plastic and he began to dismember her. He... <laughs> there we go. I can't, every time I think I've heard it all, like somebody just has to come and be like, all right, I see you and I raise you. He placed her vagina, her, her sexual organ, her vagina, in Tupperware with rice wine to preserve it and wrap the rest of the parts up before placing them in the boot of his car. The body was cut into seven parts, and later that night, he would drive to the Shingmon River in Sha Tin to dump them. <sighs> February 12th, 1982, her torso was found by a construction worker. The other parts were found separately and sent over to the mortuary, but they were unable to identify the body at first. Lamb had taken and kept photos of the entire process and kept newspaper clippings that came out after the parts were discovered. His second was very well planned out and he purchased very specific equipment for it, which included a scalpel and formaldehyde. May 29th, 1982. 31-year-old cashier Chan Wan Kit had gotten off work at 5.20 in the morning and hailed Lamb's taxi for a ride home. She was handcuffed and to death before being brought into the apartment. After his family left, Lamb set up his camera and tarps in preparation to dismember his victim. But this time he decided to have sex with her before the dismembering. Now, here's the thing. And then I feel like this is always the thing with with, uh, with us, like our creators like us. You always find these, you always find different stories. So I will say that there's some so there's some that are saying that it was the second victim that he did this with. And then there's some that say it was the last victim that he did this with. It could be both, but it was done. And this was actually <laughs> when he lost his virginity. Yeah, this was, this was when he lost, this is how he lost his virginity. Could you imagine this is how I lost. <laughs> oh, God. He cut off both her breasts and private parts to save and preserve in the, in the formaldehyde. He placed the rest of the parts in the trunk of his car and he dumped it along Tao Hang Road. June 29th, 1982, 29-year-old waitress Lung San Wan hailed Lamb's taxi cab after getting off work at around 4 a.m. She was killed very quickly after getting into the taxi before being, being brought back to Lamb's house. He took pictures and videos of the dismemberment. This time he cut the abdomen. Oh, God. He took pictures and videos of the dismemberment. This time he cut the abdomen, picked out the intestines, and 
put them inside his mouth because he wanted to know what they tasted like. Because uh, uh, he wanted to know what they tasted like, but he quickly decided to abandon the idea because it made him sick. What the what the actual fuck did you think it was gonna make you? I'm just I'm just saying. What did you think it was gonna taste like? What what were you expecting? Flaming yawn. I don't understand what the fuck you were expecting it to taste like. I, I can't imagine that it tastes good. Oh, I, I don't know why I keep doing this because I have no patience for these people. Her limbs were also abandoned on Tai Hang Road, just like the previous victim. July 2nd, 1982, 17-year-old student Lung Wai Soom was heading home from a party at the Sheraton Hotel when she got into Lamb's taxi for a ride home to Valley Road Estate in Hung Hum. Lamb would handcuff the girl and drive her around in his cab for hours, talking to her about family, religion, and life. Like, could you imagine? First of all, this this is a child. This is a baby. She's 17 years old. So you handcuff her and you drive her around talking to her about family and religion? And what? She would finally fall asleep at 4 a.m. And that's when Lamb pulled over the cab. And took her to his home. While Lamb was setting up the lighting to film the dismemberment, a lamp fell on Lung's leg and left a burn mark. He was almost caught once when he tried to develop pictures of his past victims. When the person developing the pictures questioned Lamb about the photos of dismembered limbs, Lamb told him that he was a university lab technician and that the pictures were for research purposes. The photo tech accepted this explanation and Lamb went on his way. <sighs> Police would end up putting out pictures of the missing teen begging for the public to help in any way possible. August 17th, 1983, Lamb shows back up to a Kodak Center to develop more film. While the photo tech was developing the pictures, he had to do a double take when he saw photos of a naked woman. Some of them were her whole body. Others were close-ups. They looked very staged and they resembled P-O-R-N-O-graphic pictures of like a couple. But then as he looks closer and at more of the pictures, he notices that the woman has a burn mark on her thigh and a severed breast. Horrified, as one should be, the tech immediately phones police. Lamb was scheduled to pick up the developed pictures the following day. So August 18th, 1982, two plainclothes police officers waited outside of the Kodak store to see who was going to come to retrieve the photos. Genius. Really. When Lamb showed up, police confronted him and he told them that he was picking up the pictures for a friend. Oh my God. If I hear that one more time, that's like, I'm asking for a friend. No, bitch, you are the friend. Officers accompanied Lamb to his home where his mother, father, and brother were sitting around the table just having a, a nice family dinner together. And all of a sudden, here it comes their son and police officers wanting to know what the actual fuck is going on right now. Like, when officers entered the apartment, they ordered Lamb to open the lockbox under the bed, inside the bedroom, and what they found inside shook them to their core. The contents inside the box were P-O-R-N, photographs of body body parts, videotapes of Lamb dismembering his victims, and several jars that contained female sexual organs, including a severed breast and a vagina that was pickled in formaldehyde. Oh God, why? Just why? 
Because of the number of contents that were inside the box, police were sure that he had to have help carrying out these murders. So police arrested Lamb, his father, and his brother. Because, again, Hong Kong, they don't play. And that's probably why they have such a low, low rate of crimes. Because they, they're not fucking around over there. Kudos to them. Hats off to Hong Kong. They need to teach us some stuff. Police bring them all down to the station and lock them up in three separate cells. The following morning, Lamb was taken to see his brother, who lashed out at him, screaming and kicking him. I mean, could you blame him? I'm sitting in this fucking jail cell because my brother's a psychopath, and I had no idea. Well, let that that sink in for a minute. I, I don't blame him. His brother was so furious that it would actually take several off... His brother was so furious that it would actually take officers several minutes to break the two up. Lamb promised his brother that he would tell police the truth about everything that happened. Along with detailing his horrific crimes, he told police that he didn't feel any remorse for what he had done because women were, quote, useless to society, end quote. No, you scumbag, that would be you. That's useless to society. Not us. Maybe that's because, um, or maybe that's because you couldn't get one of us. That's why you had to lose your virginity to a girl that you murdered. Because you couldn't get a live, willing participant. Is that why we're useless to society? You fucking son of a bitch. The evidence was so disturbing that police decided to not allow any females to work on the case or to sit on the jury. Lamb was dubbed the jar killer because of the organs found at the scene. He was also dubbed the rainy night killer because he would pick up his victims late at night and usually when it was raining. April 3rd, 1983, Lamb was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison at the Sheck Pick Prison. So long. All right, guys, if you're still here, thank you, thank you, thank you. I love you and I appreciate you so, so, so very much. If you have not liked, subscribed, or commented yet, please consider doing so. It really helps me out and I really, really appreciate it. Um, but that's what I was going to say. Oh, go over to Etsy. See if you like anything. Let me know if you do. If you get anything, I want to know what you get. And until next time, oh, if you have any case suggestions, email me, harding527 at yahoo.com or or leave me a message. And until next time, stay safe out there.